Good afternoon, everyone. So this is a second in our series. The first one looked at a, sort of a macro view of how the uh, COVID-19 pandemic was going to affect business in a going, in going forward and, and what we should look for. Um, as a follow-up, we're now going to look at a specific part of business, which is the market. And um, in that light, I'd like to set the table um, before I introduce our speakers. The, um, in, in April, when the, when the pandemic really started to spread, uh, New York Times uh, published an article talking about how uh, big banks were increasing their reserves in case of uh, future defaults. And they, they talked about how heavily banks were starting to reserve. Um, and then that was in April. October, Bloomberg reported that U.S. banks and lenders were still increasing their reserves, but at a slower rate. And so that's an interesting point. They're still reserving, but not, not as heavily as before. And then recently, um, just to finish setting the table for some, just for context, uh, there was an article on um, DebtWire the other day that discussed how Mall of America's uh, defaulted on their real estate tax obligations under their loan. And they're also defaulting on their payment obligations. And so uh, I think it's important to keep that in mind, especially as it relates to commercial real estate, because um, I'm sure retail is gonna be a big component of what we talk about today. With that said, I'm gonna introduce our speakers. First, we have Brandon Dorsey, Senior Vice President uh, for Bank of America. We also have Alex Horn, he's managing partner for Bridge Invest. Uh, also from Collier's as vice chairman, uh, we have Kenneth Krasno. And then from uh, Becker, my colleague and friend, uh, Phil Rosen, he is uh, our practice group leader for real estate. And so with that, I'm going to try to lead this discussion. Um, and in pre preparing for this, uh, everyone here has a, has a potential to talk a lot. So if I cut them off, it's not meant to be rude. It's just because I want to make sure everyone gets a fair chance at talking, okay? So, but first, I'm going to throw the first question to Alex. Um, by the way, when, I th when, when I, each person speaks the first time, they, they're going to explain a little bit about what they do so that you can understand how they view uh, the information they're providing to you in the context of these answers. So first will be Alex, then Ken, then Brandon, then Phil. So Alex, uh, after you explain what it is you do, uh, give an overview of what you think about the uh, commercial real estate market today. Sure, thanks John. And thank you for inviting me to participate in this panel. Uh, so I'm Alex Horn, uh, managing partner of Bridge Invest. Uh, we are asset-based direct lender focused in the Southeast US. Uh, we really focus on middle market transactions, and for us, that really means five to $50 million deals. And our core markets are Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Texas. Texas is not necessarily in the Southeast, but we like to lump it in there as well. Uh, and we, everything we do is to, uh, direct lender, a discretionary fund. To date, we finance about a billion dollars of transactions, and we hope to continue growing that over time. Uh, so to, to start off with your question about what, uh, what I'm seeing right now in the, in the CRE space or might be on the CRE space, I think the best way I can describe it is that I think the pandemic has really forced us into a binary market. So Im imagine there's a clear dividing line in the market where transactions uh, and to a greater extent asset classes fall on either, either side of this dividing line. Uh, those that fall on the right side uh, felt little effect of the pandemic. And in fact, many have actually seen continued growth. Uh, on the left side, um, those asset classes are getting pummeled and feeling the full effect of COVID. More specifically, multifamily industrial sit on the right side of that line, while hospitality and retail are clear and unfortunate wrong side of that line. And across the board, fundamentals are worse. Uh, but in a net zero interest rate environment, uh, real estate and real estate emerging as in the last two decades as a fundamental asset class for most institutional investors, there's really no option to divest uh, from real estate, but instead to reallocate. And that's, I think, why we're seeing a lot of winners, uh, even despite what's going on in the market. So money has left hospitality and retail and poured into multifamily industrial. Uh, and expect, we, I certainly expect to see that continue until we have some sort of normalcy in the market. And what's interesting is that 
investors have basically just taken a broad stroke approach to asset class rather than project quality. So the best hospitality assets, uh, the best retail assets, they're still toxic. Nobody wants to touch them. And most investors will instead look at C quality multifamily. And we see that we're seeing more activity now. Um, surprisingly, we've seen a, a very little amount of distress in the market, uh, just a huge drop in transaction volume across the board. And still there's an air of uncertainty and institutional lenders have been uh, accommodating to date, but it's unclear how long that lasts. Uh, at, at Bridge Invest, our view is, is that we're certainly, certainly going to see cracks in the market, uh, but it's a big but. There's a lot of capital available for transactions and debt is still widely available due to the incredibly deep alternative lender industry that has developed in the last decade since the, the financial crisis of 2009. So that, that liquidity has done a lot to keep market markets at reasonable prices. So generally still still pretty favorable. And I, I think that's overall all, overall kind of um, commented to my view on the series is that generally I still think that select asset classes are still generally pretty favorable on that, on um, especially multifamily and industrial. Thanks, Alex. So um, next, Ken, given um, what Alex sees as liquidity in the market for real estate transactions, um, Obviously, there's uh, uh, Alex referred to it as the right side and the left side of a dividing line. Um, you know, there's there's obviously markets that are in distress. Maybe they're hold or sell, and there are assets on the right that are buy. Um, but tell me, given this liquidity and the distress environment, maybe on the stuff that's on the left side of Alex's dividing line, um, where do you see the opportunities for? for business in, uh, in the commercial real estate market? Well, again, uh, I just want to echo what Alex said. So thank you, John, for, uh, for inviting me today. Um, you know, in the, in the distress market in general, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll talk specifically here in our local market here in South Florida. Um, you know, currently there are about 75, 80 properties that would say will be in, in special servicing. Um, and to Alex's point, about two thirds of those are, as you would expect, in the in the retail and hospitality, you know, sector. So there's clearly distress in in those segments. Um, hospitality, obviously, because you know this is a market that's basically been uh, devoid of movement, right? And if people aren't aren't traveling for business for leisure. Uh, et cetera, the hospitality market is suffering. Retail market is obviously a different dynamic because you know a lot of the trends that were happening uh, sort of po you know pre-COVID have really just been accelerated um, during this uh, you know COVID period. Uh, our, our famous saying now is we're seeing you know trends that probably would have taken you know two, three, five, seven years you know of transformation uh, have really happened in the last seven months. So clearly retail and, and, and hospitality are in the crosshairs of uh, distress. Uh, again, to Alex's point, um, there's certain capital that is uh, attempting to circle uh, those you know, distress uh, wagons. And we're starting to see some of that uh, trade start to you know, materialize now. Um, so there are people that are that are clearly focused on on that segment of the market, on the on kind of the right side of the equation, uh, as I as as Alex also mentioned, you know, of those seventy whatever seventy seven deals, uh, three of them are in industrial. So that that continues to be you know the strongest segment of our of our market. We just did a uh, a study for one of our large developers, and this is across the country, not just in South Florida. Uh, last year there were about 20 transactions in the country, over half a million square feet for distribution for the Amazons and the like of the world. This year to date, there have been 61. And last year that was about, that represented about 14 million square feet. This year it's a little, almost 55 million square feet. So the e-commerce, the explosion of e-commerce um, as, as a proportion of how people are spending and shopping and so on and so forth has exploded. Um, and is only going to continue to accelerate. You know, the people that are used to shopping online 
uh, are going to continue to shopping online. That's changing the whole dynamic of the retail market, of the retail footprint, and, and where uh, retailers are choosing to locate. But that trend is accelerated, clearly causing disruption and distress uh, in, in the retail market uh, and to a certain degree, obviously, in the hospitality market. Most of our estimates on the hospitality market are looking at normalizations probably in 23 or 24. Um, so, you know, that's going to continue to cause uh, some, some, some pain and distress uh, as some of these uh, smaller and mid-sized operators uh, are going to feel that, 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 that strain, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future. So the big question, and I know we're going to get to this maybe a little bit later, is kind of the, you know, the, the, the monkey in the middle there, which is the office market, which is kind of a little bit in, in, in neutral. Uh, there's a lot of trends talking about what the future is going to look like, but not a lot of movement, you know, in the current state that that's that points to uh, distress in that market. But it's it's clearly uh, going to be going to be moving as we look through, you know, 21 and into you know the into the future. So I'm sure we'll get to that later. And I didn't mean to take up your time. But. No, thanks, Ken. So so um, Ken does raise the office, but. But Brandon, please don't address office yet, because then we're going to cut this this webinar short. And we're going to we're going to short we're going to shoot some ladder to the end. So let's not do that. Um, but but Brandon, given the liquidity that Alex was talking about in the right and left side of that dividing line, and where Ken was talking about the distress side, what those deals are looking like, and the positive side with industrial, uh, please tell us some of the unique deals and opportunities you guys are looking at um, in the in the CRE market. Sure. Um, I work with uh, real estate owner operators, business owner operators. I really, you know, build a bank around them, and it's I, I'm I'm not necessarily seeing the right side, left side. Although I get it, right? Um, we're working on a, a deal now. It's actually started, and and I know my my buddy who uh, actually called me on Saturday about this deal is on, but it started with a resi mortgage that went sideways, and we're about to do the whole building, right? And this is a multifamily. Um, you know, we're also, you know, working on a, a retail deal and it was hard, right? But it was hard in understanding the tenant, right? It wasn't target, but, uh, you know, but we're there, right? You know, with, a, with the right sponsor profile, we really can do anything. You know, I'm, you know, knee deep in a, a storage deal. Um, I guess to your point, we're working on a fulfillment center. But what's unique about this fulfillment center is it's a new building, right? It's a new building. The historicals aren't there, so you're really relying on, you know, the business owner's previous and current experience to actually, you know, execute, you know, in the, in this new facility. And we're also doing a logistics and, and trucking deal as well. So it's, you know, kind of across the whole gamut, just some of the things that I'm seeing. Um, what's unique isn't just what I'm working on, it is the environment that we're doing it in, and we're doing it inside the private bank. Right. I mean, I can only imagine in the commercial bank and you know other areas of the bank what it is that we're doing. So just to give you a sense. But Brandon, are are you are, are there deals you're looking away from because of the current environment? <laughs> Phil, Phil knows. I've never seen a deal I didn't like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, there, there there are profiles because we're not necessarily deal specific, right? In, in the private bank, because I'm a recourse lender, right? It can actually be the profile, not the actual deal that, you know, I could say, you know what, I know it's not gonna be a fit. Um, so yeah, you know, it's temporary, but yeah, there are definitely opportunities that I've seen that a year ago we would have done. What are some factors that you're using to look away from particular issues given COVID specific factors, not just things that you would look at on, on any other period? You know, the, the biggest factor is if you take a, a step back, I would say, and you look at the opportunity holistically, um, whether it's, you know, office, let's say that tenant mix, you know, gets cut in half over a five or seven year period. Uh, if it's, you know, retail, and your, your tenant mix right now is at 90% and that goes to 50%. Like, what does that look like, right? What does that repayment 
um, you know, structure look like, right? That first and second source to repayment. And while that's important, important, like you meant it, you said it, right? You mentioned the loss reserves, there's no secret, right? You, you heard it across the whole banking industry, right? I mean, the inability of someone to repay a bank and especially make their principal payments directly affects, right, your ability to lend. I mean, that's that tier one capital coming in. The less you have, the less you can lend, the more you have to post reserves. So that risk, and the likelihood of the bank experiencing that risk um, is something that could cause us to look away, right? I always say, right, we're your bank, we're not your equity partner. So, you know, that's a, that, that's a risk, right? Building to repay. Yeah. Okay. So, Phil, you you uh, you do deals on the, the the debt side and the lender side. You do deals on the buyer and the seller. You know, we, we do them which, whichever side we we end up on, and given the Given the parameters that you heard from uh, Alex and Brandon, and the the market the way it's described by Ken, um, you know, tell us what you're seeing in the wave of real estate given the distress that a lot of business is facing. Sure, thanks for having me, John. And you pretty much said what we do: we represent investors, lenders, and developers in their all their transactions. So when we first, when COVID first hit, I had a lot of clients calling me, the lenders. Uh, commercial landlords, commercial tenants. And I told all of my tenant clients, you have to open kimono. You have to tell your, uh, your landlord what's going on. You have to be honest with them and upfront, don't stick your head in the sand. I told my clients who were having problems with their lenders to do the same. And I told my lenders and my landlords to demand transparency from, uh, from the people that owe the money. Uh, what happened then was it seemed like everybody was willing to play ball. There were a lot of forbearance agreements entered into. Uh, banks universally were giving three months, some even six months, uh, even though people are asking for 18 months. Uh, and you know now what we're seeing is the end of that forbearance period. Uh, and so I haven't really started seeing distressed deals coming through, but you can read the tea leaves right now. Uh, there will be some banks that will be willing to do some sort of extension on the forbearance, maybe another three to six months. Uh, we all know about what's happening in CN. You're looking at 10 and a half to serve across all hotels are at 26% and retails at 18%. Uh, those are astronomical numbers. So I think the first wave of distressed deals that you'll see after the lenders try to figure out whether they can do some sort of long-term restructure. Um, those long-term restructures in CMBS debt are most likely going to require uh, the principals to come up with more cash, right? Some sort of pay down, uh, something to make the special servicer uh, comfortable that the owner is well capitalized and uh, was asking for help the way most people uh, should have in that situation. Once that happens, I think you're going to see a lot of assets uh, potentially going into foreclosure. But this is not 2008 and 2009. Uh, the difference that I see between then and now is that Wall Street has such a tremendous involvement in real estate in a way that they didn't before. Think of all the single family homes that have been purchased in the last 10 years uh, by the Blackstones and the like. Uh, Wall Street is very much involved in real estate. Uh, it, it has been uncovered as a tremendous investment in the long term, regardless of what asset class you're in. So uh, to, to echo what Alex said, there's so much capital sitting on the sidelines right now that I don't think you're going to see the 30 to 40 to 50 percent haircuts on a lot of assets. Um, so, you know, I mentioned hotel and retail. Retail has been in its own little death spiral lately, and you do read a lot about what's happening with uh, shopping malls, what's happening with strip centers. Uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of owners trying to repurpose. Uh, the problem is they can repurpose, but the value of that property is going to go down. Retail rents are generally going to be the highest and best use for those retail areas, unless you can create something special there. So I think you're going to first see CMBS loans going bad, uh, which will include a lot of retail. Uh, I've got a lot of people who have called me in the last month telling me that they're looking for hotel deals, especially suite hotels 
that they can convert into affordable housing, uh, that they can convert into assisted living. So I think you're gonna see some hotels um, with uh, the adequate facilities, especially suite hotels because they're plumbed and electric for, uh, for potential studio and one bedroom use, you'll see some conversion there. Uh, because like Ken said, we're not gonna get back to regular levels uh, for some time. And those levels may never get back up uh, in the near future because people aren't traveling for business, right? The five of us aren't up on stage somewhere, we're sitting at home. Uh, by the way, this is the first time in about four months I'm wearing a button down shirt. This is very uncomfortable. Thanks, Thanks for sharing, Phil. Yeah. Hey, Alex, um, you know, part of what Phil was talking about is this idea of um, what deals are moving, what deals aren't moving. And from the, uh, from the, the lender side, right, and, and talking about forbearance and, 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 and putting deals in place, you, you probably have a pretty unique perspective on what, what the borrower world looks like uh, under COVID. So what, what, what's going on now, what's different from before versus what's the same? So I'll start, I'll start off with that second part about what's different, what's different now. Um, I think the, the, the best way to set the stage, um, the, there's just massive dislocation in the market. As Phil mentioned, CMBS issuance is way down um, and traditional institutions are just very picky on the deals that they're doing. So this dislocation has caused a, a reset of what deals go where, since nobody really knows what fits into which box, uh, which bucket of financing. So a lot of deals are just getting shopped around like crazy with a lot of people doing a crazy amount of work, but not getting anything done. So to, to illustrate this, if you think pre-COVID, there were five deals in the market, each deal stayed in its own lane, and it would go to effectively uh, each one of the, the, the lenders that it makes sense to go to. Um, borrow, and when borrowers were kind of plugging in kind of the cost of capital, they could do this with, with a high degree of certainty in their models of what more or less leverage and, and cost of capital they would do. Um, and you fast forward to today, um, those same five deals are getting shown to all the same five lenders, uh, but all of them are getting shown to every single lender. And of those five transactions, three of them just get pulled from the market entirely. So it happens that I think Brandon, myself, and every other institutional lender and every other lender are looking at those five deals. We're all saying, hey, this might fit my boss, this might not, but all of a sudden for some reason it does or it doesn't. So just a lot of work and a lot of inefficiency. Um, and, and to illustrate this further, we, we lost a few land deals to banks in, in the past six months that I would have never expected a traditional bank to do even pre-COVID. And on the flip side of that, I have a deal signed up right now for a uh, for a Wawa's with 19 years remaining on their lease term at a conservative leverage that I, should have met, I shouldn't be doing. Don't tell the borrower that, but that, that <laughs> deal should not be coming to me. So in, in, short, in short, the market is, is a bit strange. Um, asset back lending and, and kind of when you look at asset back lending, um, it's still fairly active. Uh, and, and we're typically, we're typically a little bit more on the expensive side of the, the, the um, uh, the spectrum. So um, it's not usually, it's not usually the first call. It, it's, uh, but, but whoever's calling us for deals, we're still very active. And, and those lenders like us that were well positioned prior to the pandemic are doing deals. Uh, we're being fairly aggressive. In fact, I see this as an opportunity for bridge invest to take market share. Um, and sure, we're, we're a bit more conservative on valuation, but really rates and LTVs are pretty close to where they were pre-COVID. Uh, today, for instance, for the fourth quarter and beginning in the fourth quarter, we have $90 million of deals signed up uh, in five different transactions in, in major metropolitan areas, but mostly outside of Florida. So our biggest concentration of, of these deals right now are, are in Atlanta. Uh, and we're just a bit more conservative on hospitality and retail, but we're still actively looking at those asset classes. Um, and I think a lot of other asset back lenders are as well. Uh, in particular, we're interested in construction across all asset classes and select land transactions in um, in infill locations. Uh, in fact, in in fact, one of those five deals that I just mentioned uh, is actually a retail and office construction deal in Atlanta. Uh, and the terms, as I mentioned, are similar to what they were before, but just kind of illustrating at very very high level. 
uh, terms on, on traditional asset backed lenders are 12 to 36 months. Our rates really range from 8 to 11 percent. We're very, very heavily focused on middle markets so of five to $50 million transactions. And our LTV will go up to 75% LTV and 90% of loan to cost. Um, and, and those top ends are really for more for multifamily transactions. You start scaling it down from there. Uh, both those are market. And like I mentioned, we're trying to be a little bit more aggressive to take more market share. And typically timing for us to close will be anywhere from two to four weeks. And this is, this is also something where I will applaud and uh, applaud Phil and the Becker team that uh, you guys always do impeccable job structure and closing our complex legal transactions in the time. All right, enough points. Enough, Alex. You don't want that guy's head to get too big. It won't fit Thanks, in the screen. Um, <laughs> Alex, just as a quick, just as a quick follow-up though, the the um, these deals that you're putting together where you're more aggressive, maybe on pricing. What about um, when you go to deal docs? Are you looking at um, different uh, covenants now? versus before COVID? No, they, they're they actually very similar. Uh, we're using the same exact legal docs um, and we're not uh, we're not asking for more than we were before. Uh, generally, all our deals that we do are non-recourse with some sort of uh, bad boy carve out. Uh, and that's really what we're requesting from our borrowers. Um, the one, the, I'd say the one difference that we ask now uh, that we're more focused on is what does your real estate portfolio look like and where are you having trouble? Just so we can make sure that um, we, whoever we're financing has the capability of, of um, servicing our debt if they need to. Okay, thanks. So um, Ken, I'm gonna to go to you next. So, um, you know, we've talked, we've talked a little bit about retail. You talked a little bit more about retail um, and you talked about acceleration. Um, where do you see the retail market um, uh, for real estate now, given COVID and um, the left left side, right side that uh, Alex was referring to, and maybe the a little closer scrutiny, even though they're writing deals, uh, even though Brandon's writing deals in retail, but looking at them a little bit more carefully. What, what, what are you seeing on the um, on the transaction flow side? Yeah. It's a it's a it's a tough question because quite honestly the the market is is evolving as I as I mentioned before um, and it's really kind of transforming and um, so what you are seeing is retail kind of transforming itself you know uh, it, it's no longer um, all only about you know kind of the, the physical proximity you know it, it always used to be you know centered on uh, location, 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 and sort of a, you know, primary, you know, uh, proximity to your, you know, to your, to your customer. Now, as, as, as e-commerce has become, you know, central to a retailer's, you know, kind of value proposition, the way they're looking at space, um, you know, is changing. And you're starting to see a melding of, you know, kind of distribution showroom, retail experiential um, and so that changes the type of the type of footprint that retailers are looking at the the way that they're they're designing uh stores you know going forward so phil talked about it a little bit um you know the repurposing of some of these malls or strip centers or so on and so forth is is really what is is happening now and what is transpiring and transforming the retail market um, it's going to require a lot of capital because there is going to be, uh, you know, a complete sort of retrofitting of of the of the physical, you know, footprint. But the 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 and you've heard this this uh, saying before, you know, the omni-channel uh, perspective. You know, a retailer that doesn't have a robust, uh, proactive, customer-centric, you know, e-commerce uh, platform built into it. Um, and is solely relying on a physical pr footprint uh, will not, you know, make it. Conversely, we're seeing a number of, you know, e-commerce only, uh, and you're seeing them all over the place, whether it's Aways or the Warby Parkers and the, you know, the Lululemons, you know, that are moving from what was a purely, you know, e-commerce digital platform into that omni-channel space. And so um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a transformative market. 
uh, one that requires, you know, a lot of strategy, a lot of foresight, a lot of capital, um, because it's going to take, uh, you know, it's no longer about just putting boxes, uh, you know, up and, and figuring out whether you're going to have a, you know, a supermarket and a TJ Maxx and, and so on and so forth. So, um, it is, it is a, it is a, it is a dynamic market. And, and the reality and the sad reality is that we're as a country, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 10, uh, uh, you know, the amount of space in terms of being over retailed, you know, the amount of physical space uh, for the, for the amount of, of, of people, population shopping and so on and so forth. So that's going to force a transformation on one end, you know, repurposing, recapitalizing, re, you know, orienting certain retail and other retail just basically being eviscerated and evaporated and, you know, and, and repurposed into something, uh, you know, completely different. But I think at the end of the day, and, you know, we're talking, you know, over the next couple of years, you're going to see a dramatically smaller retail footprint uh, across the country than, than I think you're, uh, you're seeing today. And unfortunately, that's going to cause pain and, uh, and, and, uh, and distress for some of those, you know, owners or holders of that, you know, of that retail property. Thanks. Um, hey, Brandon, so you have liquidity, you have potential ex, uh, excess inventory, um, and on the institutional lender side, how are you seeing credit these days? Is it tightening, loosening, and how long do you think either is going to last? What do you, what do you, you know, put your fortune teller hat on? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I, I definitely saw and felt the tightening in May, and you know, it, it I, I actually can't tell if being familiar with the process and the ability to get things done now is equal to a looser process, right? Because you get clients done as long as they can get done, they don't necessarily get the feeling that things are tighter, right? Um, or have things actually loosen, i.e. we are, you know, working on a retail deal that, you know, sh should close, you know, before Thanksgiving, for example. Um, that, that's 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 a really good question. I can see the hurdles of getting things done being a little higher, but they don't they're not materially high to the point where you just throw your hands up and say this is impossible. Um, do you think that's attributed because there's more liquidity and banks they have to do business in order to generate revenues and profits, or do you do you see that as just um, banks are looking at their risk in a different way than they used to? I think. Banks are monitoring their risk a lot more closer than they probably were a year ago. And, you know, I mean, I don't work for Wells Fargo, for example, but, you know, I would wager no institution out there is, is taking anything for granted. So they're just not going to do that, you know, retail strip center, like you said, you know, with a target anchor right there they're definitely going to look closer and probably ask more questions today about the underlying tenants than they would have a year ago all right thanks so phil so you have alex saying that he's using essentially the same deal docs maybe a few different things that are covid related um uh you have brandon talking about more hurdles to getting the deal done but once they once they're in the glide path for getting it done it's pretty much going to come in for a landing um you talk about the different asset classes that are potentially in, I guess, in the target for being scrutinized more carefully. Um, and you and your team do, do the deal docs. So what are you seeing in overall and what, what lenders are doing in, uh, in deal docs? I mean, back before 2008, you used to hear cov light, right? Let, there'd be no covenants in a deal. And then after 08, you, have, you had heavy covenants and now, um, are you seeing, you know, are you seeing deals that have COVID covenants? So a couple of things. So Alex is more of the bridge lender type. So his doc's going to be pretty strong to begin with, um, which is a good thing. So here's a couple of things that we're seeing. Uh, widely publicized are lenders requiring, you know, six to 12 months of interest up front. It's making deals more expensive. Um, 
you know, people have to be worried about adverse change provisions, right? Because sometimes uh, you've got lenders now who are talking to us about make, trying to make those adverse change position, uh, provisions a little bit more broad. Uh, so it gives the lender the ability to force a lockbox or other cash management uh, provisions uh, and also to maybe have a better excuse to stop uh, cash advances uh, on construction, et cetera. So that's something that people are looking at. But we're also getting some requests to look at our um, lease approvals, especially if you have a borrower that's in distress, uh, the lender's gonna wanna have a hand in approving tenants because you've got a landlord who is desperate to bring in tenants you know, they're in distress, they're not doing well with their loan, and then they sign up somebody as a tenant who doesn't belong there. And if they lose the property, the tenant's got a lease and it's gonna be very hard to get rid of that tenant, makes things worse uh, for the bank. So you have some lenders that are asking for stricter lease approval provisions. Uh, another thing that we're advising our borrower clients on uh, is on the reps and warranties. Uh, it's sort of a gotcha because when, you have to report your financials to many lenders. Uh, what you're also doing is you're deemed to be restating your reps and warranties. And now while your financial condition might have been fine when you did the loan in 2016, uh, in 2020, uh, maybe it's not the case any longer. You think you're doing you know, what you're supposed to be doing by giving them financials, uh, but at the same time, you might be triggering some sort of indirect default. So lenders are starting to get wise to ways that they can control the, the borrower a little bit more uh, when they're in a default situation. Uh, so it, it's a little bit tricky. You know, you're seeing uh, more focus on business interruption. You're seeing more focus on force majeure clauses. Uh, and again, the financial reporting. Uh, overall, I haven't seen this huge sea change, but it's been these little things well, now you ask me this question, I'm sort of running through all the conversations I've had the last six months in my head, and you're right. Uh, I think the lenders are getting a little tougher where they need to. Quite frankly, some lenders are just playing catch up. Uh, you know, Ken, I was looking at my notes and just getting back to the repurposing. I have a number for you, uh, two numbers. Um, with regard to retail closings, right now nationwide, there are over 400 retrofit proposals out there and there's another 315 uh, retrofits in process or completed for retail space. So that just shows you what, uh, you know, it, it's really trying to, you're separating the strong from the weak in retail and the folks that can really withstand this and say, you know what, we're gonna pull all the chips off the table. We're gonna, we're gonna retrofit and we're just gonna wait for that next wave. So it's just, uh, I thought that was interesting to throw in there. So just as a cautionary tale for on the on the lender side of this, um, recognize that um, there was there's an old tried and true uh, claim that borrowers can bring when you exert too much control over a borrower for lender liability. So be careful how much control a lender asserts over a borrower because you end up on both sides of that transaction. And when that happens, watch out. That's when I get involved. But we're not here to talk about me getting involved. So um, moving, moving over, Ken, so you, know, you talk about these new covenants and um, part of those covenants could include use covenants, right? And what, what you're gonna use and what you're not gonna use the property for. And um, there are uh, specialty concepts we saw pop up like WeWork. Um, given COVID, I don't know how group space is gonna fare, even if forgetting WeWork and the bad business decisions they made in the past, but how, how office space and and, and, and group, groups working without doors and, and, and walls is gonna fare after COVID. Um, but given, given the uh, way office spaces start to introduce what you were hinting to earlier in this talk, um, what are you seeing as far as um, these distressed office space or specialty space uh, concepts? Those are, I mean, two generally different areas. When I when I think of uh, generally, we talk about specialty, you know, office space. A lot of what we're seeing, to Phil's point, on the on the repurposing in a lot of retail, you'll see a lot of medical, um, you know, medical office and and medical, you know, uses that are you know very obviously heavily specialized. 
but benefit from you know that synergy in a in a, in a retail center um, and 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 kind of create a different uh, dynamic within a within a within a center. With regard to the you know the the what generally would be described as you know co working you know WeWork is is given that platform a bad name you know they made some you know horrendous business decisions but the 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 model of providing flexible alternative workspaces for peoples and for companies um, is uh, is generally successful and going to be more so um, as this kind of new dynamic of you know work from home work from anywhere uh, technology really you know this this experiment that was kind of forced upon all of us you know look at what we're doing you know here today um, but but that is taking shape um, so again that's one of those pre-covid, uh, trends that a lot of companies were trying to experiment with, trying to give their employees some work-life balance, trying to create some, you know, flexible uh, environment. Now it was just kind of forced upon you, right? Everybody had to go home. Everybody had to work from home. And companies have figured out what's working, what's not working. Um, and what I think universally has been uh, sort of accepted is that the co-working type space, you know, call it the third wheel. You know, you go to the office, you work from home, but there's also that third alternative. There's that work, uh, you know, in an other yet somewhat productive uh, environment um, is going to be a part of the of the solution. It again, it provides uh, companies and their employees that flexibility. It provides them the ability. I mean, not everybody. I mean, if my wife and daughter walk in any minute now, the, the 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 aspect of working from home is not always ideal, right? I mean, there's benefits of it, but it's not always uh, perfect. So, you know, if there was a an a, 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 an office a shared environment, you know, down the block, around the corner, uh, that would give me the ability to work uh, a little bit more uh, productively. Uh, companies are gonna are gonna provide that for their you know, for their employees. So we are starting to see companies build that model. And you've heard a number of people talk about this, you know, kind of hub and spoke model where there'll be kind of the central office where, uh, com you know, people will be brought together uh, for the type of, of environment that everybody I think is missing, even on, you know, I'm sure on this call, you know, collaborative work, creativity, you know, just culture. Um, so the office still, uh, and, and all of the surveys that we've conducted, you know, we're a, we're a global organization. We've conducted surveys with tens of thousands of employees and uh, employers all over the world. Universally, people have said that this works, but it's not ideal. And that the, the, the culture, the camaraderie, the creativity that you can only get in, a, in an office environment is, is critical to a company's success. So that's where you're hearing a little bit of this hub and spoke model where the central office will still be a, a critical part of a company's strategy and their portfolio might be smaller because they might now have these satellite offices spread throughout where their employees are. They might have more uh, facilities within you know, the, the, the WeWorks of the world to give their employees who are working from home and are not commuting into the office, you know, five days a week, but maybe go to the office, you know, a day or two a week, but need, you know, can't work in their apartment because it's only, you know, 600 square feet or, or so on and so forth. So the, the, the flexibility of providing these various workspaces um, externally and internally, I think you mentioned before, um, the another trend that I think you're going to start to see is kind of the, uh, you know, the de-densification of, of office space, right? Everybody was moving to a model where everybody was working on benches and, you know, sitting on top of each other and, uh, the you know, no, no walls and no doors and, and so on and so forth. And I think that the, the COVID, you know, post-COVID uh, environment is saying to everybody that uh, space 
uh, is going to be important in, 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 the, in the workplace. So as much as some companies might be taking less space because their people are going to be dispersed and they'll do with this hub and spoke model, um, creating more privacy and more separation within the space uh, in, in some respects counterbalances that. So that's why I kind of put office in that middle category because yeah. a lot of this is still, you know, uh, being being worked out, you know, kind of as we speak. And as you know, office decisions like Becker's are long-term major capital investments and companies don't make those kind of decisions uh, lightly uh, or, or cavalier. So, right. so they're taking their time. Okay. So Alex, given, given the framework of everything we've talked about right now, uh, give us an idea of some of the unusual or, or unique, maybe cutting edge type deals you guys are working on to give us a sense of what the future might look like. Sure, uh, I'd be happy to. But first, I, I want to just go back to what Ken was just talking about, because Ken, I, I love the idea of the concept that, that you just uh, that you talked about, about this third wheel um, of co-working space or the shared working space as part of kind of part of the, the, the trilogy of kind of how we work. Um, and I think it's fantastic. I mean, I, I've never heard that, but it totally makes sense. And I talk to people, colleagues all every time, like all the time, and people are, I think the biggest positive about working from home is that you can actually pick up and go work somewhere else, right? You can go work at, a, at a, your parents' house. You can go uh, travel. My, my brother, who lives in New York, is, is considering going to, to Park City for, for the winter to go to be able to ski on the weekend and work during the week. Um, and I think this shared, this shared work uh, concept uh, or the shared work environment with kind of this all access path that companies can give their employees really gives a, a, a huge flexibility for people to be, you know, a, huge, a, a large part of their time in the office, uh, but then some part also some, some kind of benefit to be able to go travel and do different things and so forth. And in fact, um, when Sandeep uh, Nathrani took over for, uh, for Adam Newman for and we work, he even he even talked about like how he was going to use this pandemic to shed some of the bad leases that we work did and really kind of put some pressure on the landlords and let them out of their leases with like lower lower uh, lower penalties. So uh, even I think even they are seeing the light that uh, that the ten you're you're talking about here. So um, I totally agree. Uh, so John, sorry to, to go back to, to your question about some of the deals that we're seeing. Um, Surprisingly, I'll tell you, surprisingly, what we're not seeing is, uh, is a lot of distress opportunities. Um, th there are very few non-performing loans in the market that, that we're seeing right now to be purchased. Um, and we, we were also kind of on that initial bandwagon of saying, hey, there, there's going to be opportunity here to, to buy or to finance people on non-performing notes. But we, had, we haven't really seen that come to fruition. Um, a lot of what we are seeing today are refinancing of existing existing business plans. Uh, sorry, refinancing of, of projects that kind of blew through their original timelines of their business plan. So they need to refinance, uh, including an interest reserve for a period of time until they can get to their next step in their business cycle. So whether that's a sale that's sufficient DSCR to go to to Brandon um, or some lease up strategy. Uh, New pro on the other side of that, we are seeing some new projects and some new development opportunities, and that really focuses more on the multifamily industrial and a bit of office space. Um, and there's not that the and when I talk about more multifamily space, one other place that we've seen that has been a big um, a big new kind of asset class uh, in this pandemic is single family rental market. Um, and, and that's a good example of a transaction we're doing right now that was something that we did before, but was not nearly um, a focus of the business as it is now. Uh, so we're doing right now a, a $6 million loan for a repeat sponsor to purchase 77 acres of land for single family rental community uh, outside of Charlotte. Um, this is a, an, an example of a deal that's on the right side of that line that I talked about. Uh, the developer here developed the strategy uh, Pre-COVID, I've been working on this pre-COVID pre to to really work for to to really develop a project that's an amenity-heavy single-family rental community um, in strong markets in the Carolinas and Tennessee. 
uh, they've they've seen tremendous appetite from uh, for their product um, and a huge inflow of institutional capital into this asset class. So we've developed a good program with the sponsor to use our debt to purchase these properties. Um, so we give them uh, this gives them the, the time to develop their business plan for the property, raise institutional equity, and then our loan can even convert to a construction loan should they choose it. Uh, so this is the third project we're doing with them. Um, it's a local a local Miami-based group, and we're offer, we basically have offered them anywhere from 55 to 60 percent of the purchase price of the land to buy that asset, and then figure out what they want to do with that business plan. So that's something that's unique from this market um, that uh, we did a little bit before, but now we're doing a lot more. Of. Okay, Brendan, how about you? What are you guys uh, looking at as uh, really exciting on your side of the uh, market? The excitement is really the sponsors, okay? the actual people that we're coming in contact with. That is what excites me. I mean, I've really been able to engage virtually, right? I mean, you can't even go see them, right? <laughs> with, right. with folks, you know, there have been some wild, mo wild moments in you know, size and scale, uh, probably had five, you know, wow moments. Like, man, you know, I've been waiting five years to talk to you. Like, this is great. Um, you know, that is where at least I, as, as one, um, am right now. And it's leveraging a virtual platform you know, to meet, talk to, greet, share, you know, have virtual conferences, what have you, right? Stretch it out and shake it up and change it and make it as exciting as possible. I mean, that's really the belly of it. Because this, this could be, here and I could be doing this for another year, right? I, I just don't know. So, you know, figuring it out and, trying to make it somewhat cool, um, you know, that's, you know, you know, that's, that's pretty exciting. And the first opportunity that I talked about, and it's a big deal. You know, it's probably all in half a billion dollars, right? That's, for me, that's a big number. For, for some of you guys, right? But for me, that's a big number. Right. That's a big number. That's a big number. Uh, Phil, how about you? What's your deal flow looking like? Uh, well, we don't have the same volume as we did last year at this time, that is for sure, but we are still transacting. Uh, where we're seeing a lot of movement right now is the triple net space. You know, clients who were buying, you know, Wendy's, uh, McDonald's, uh, Burger King, uh, the properties under those. Uh, it seems like, you know, you can't put your money in the bank. Uh, people are a little bit nervous with the stock market because it has become so volatile. So real estate is one of the only places that people can invest and feel comfortable because it does move much more slowly. Uh, industrial, we'll we are still seeing movement, uh, but I, I have clients that do industrial and they are underwriting deals all day long and the deals are just very expensive and they're having a hard time wrapping their heads around them. Uh, multifamily, you know, prices have gone up. Cap rates have actually compressed. And while deals are transacting in that multifamily arena, you're seeing a much lower volume. Uh, the biggest impediment to some of these multifamily deals trading uh, is that they've got really high defeasance because when interest rates go down, the defeasance goes up because the lender wants to be made whole as to the interest they were going to make up to a certain period. And so you're seeing properties where uh, defeasance, prepayment penalties are going up by a million or $2 million. So what I've seen is that the, there are the same properties on the market. They've been languishing there for a year or more. And then other ones are coming up on the market and they're getting above ask uh, and, and they're moving. But, you know, there's a finite number of those deals uh, that are actually happening. Office, you know, can you alluded to this? Office is in limbo right now. Nobody knows how to value office right now. It's, it's almost impossible. And then retail. You know, I think people are going to look back at retail in five years and say, wow, if I would have picked up that plaza for X dollars, I should have bought it because I could have just bought it and hung on and now look at it. So really, the only people that are buying retail now are those that are brave and uh, well capitalized. Uh, so I'm not really seeing much of that happening either. Uh, I am seeing stuff happening in the owner occupied space. Uh, we're seeing clients who are taking the opportunity now to go in and buy maybe some flex property, you know, office with some warehouse in the back, uh, because it's a good time. And, uh, I know the banks that, uh, I talk to, 
they're thrilled to do any sort of owner occupied deal uh, because there are certain businesses that we all know are they're thriving during COVID. And if they continue to do well, uh, you know, lending to an owner occupied uh, business is uh, it's a pretty safe bet. They're going to care about the property more than somebody who's an investor who's halfway across the country, who doesn't mind just giving the keys back, losing their equity and walking away. All right. So um, we're running out of time. So really quick, uh, lightning round on office since Phil raised it. Um, there's a you know class A space, class B space, and probably class C space. Um, how do you feel about office space? Uh, we'll start with Alex. Yeah, office. Uh, so office space, I, depending on the market, I'm very bullish, uh, especially on class A office. Uh, and especially when you look at South Florida, uh, there's been a net migration for from the Northeast, uh, major metros of the Southeast. And if you're like compared to New York, office market in Miami is on sale. Uh, think, think we're, I think really think we're going to see new records for Class A office in the next few years. Uh, and couple that with the migration with the change, couple that migration with the changes in office um, to suit our, our needs now for sanitation and safety, it will result in more space for each employee. So I, I generally think that office in our core markets, uh, in our core market, as everyone here in Southeast Florida, I think it's going to do very well. Um, and anecdotally, I'll tell you that, that we, uh, we're, we're office out of First Citizens Tower, uh, the former SBS Tower in Coconut Grove. And we, we, face the, we face Northeast view, which is basically the Bay and Brickle. And uh, I wanted to lease my, my neighbor's space because they were leaving. And they, they basically looked inland. And I went to my landlord and asked them to, to see if I could lease it when they were leaving. And they said, oh, we already have a proposal at the same rate you're paying, which is about mid 40s range um, with no TIs. And this is space that hasn't been renovated in 15 to 20 years, which is crazy if you think about what, what that means uh, for the office space. In the middle of pandemic, where we haven't been to the office um, in close to a year. Someone is actually doing a, a very, very aggressive deal. And this is not this is not a, like a one data point. A lot of people have told me similar, similar sort of sort of stories. So I'm, I'm generally pretty bullish on, on office. All right. Brandon, what about you? Um, you know, the, the, the cost of foot. I mean, the, the leasing, we just looked, remember, we just looked at an office deal. Um, it's one of those, can you do it versus yeah, right? Should you do it? Um, you know, there was some app apprehension there. And, you know, if we feel that worst case scenario, you, you got a dark building, like I said, or 50% dark, you know, two years from now, three years from now, um, you know, where's the sponsor, right? You know, you know, can they carry it, right? Okay. And from a relationship standpoint, now this is like where, you know, me internally talking to, you know, my team, like what kind of experience do you want certain people to have, you know, with the bank? And if it seems like there's going to be a bad or, or, or volatile experience, right, I, I, I personally would rather not do it. Um, and office does fit in that category. Got so, it. you know, every deal when it comes to office will stand on its own merit and right. some look better than others. It's tough. All right. So I'm going to throw this to Ken and then I have one question. 31 exchange and the potential. Did he freeze or did I freeze? He froze. <laughs> All right, well, the show must go on. What? <laughs> All right, Phil, you asked the question. All right, uh, <laughs> that's great. All right, so I'm just looking at a list of questions that I have here. Okay. Yeah. You know what, actually, you know, <laughs> what do we think is going to happen, you know, if, uh, if the 1031 rules change, what do you guys think could potentially, could that chill the market? Could that, is it not going to matter much? What are we thinking? So uh, Phil, I'll, I'll just jump in here because it, it's actually a question I had for you that I want to know what your clients are saying because that Wallace deal that I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the, the sponsor in that deal is saying, 
basically that he, he wants a refinance to pay off his construction loan and his exit is 1031 buyer. And it's, it's, uh, it's a conversation we've been having internally uh, for, for a few days now about what happens to that market. Uh, generally, the, where we've ended up is that that market, even if it goes away, will take a little bit of time. Um, so we'll, we'll get an opportunity to see it coming uh, because it's not it, it's it's on uh, the Democratic agenda if, if Biden uh, Biden were to win. But they have other things um, that I think are uh, that are are that take priority to that. So uh, we'd have a little bit of time to work through that and see what happens as an industry. Uh, but more importantly, the, the triple net space is still something that is a heavy, heavily coveted asset because of the 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 coupon clipping nature of it. So I think there might be some effects to it, but ultimately I still think that it's a, a very solid fundamental asset regardless of the tax savings or not. Sorry, I cut out. I must have lost the connection. They bumped me out. Either that or they got tired of hearing me talk. Probably the last. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> so John, we didn't hear what you said. I, so I we, went with the 10, we went with the 1031 question. And okay, good. Back to that big. Good. All right. So uh, did everyone answer already? Uh, no, Alex just went. All right. Brandon? Yeah, so as far as 1031s, I, I think it could affect, you know, pricing, right? Um, because you, there'd just be, you know, less capital put to work in it probably has a broader effect on other asset classes because all of a sudden, right, if you got to pay taxes on the sale, right, capital gains or capital gains, well, you know, what about my stock portfolio? What about my bond portfolio, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I do think there'll be, you know, a effect, but it's, um, it could be more to diversification and affect pricing in real estate. Right. Okay. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think um, it, it has a nominal effect, but there's still, you know, underlying, you know, kind of fundamentals and other sort of macro factors that'll kind of offset it. There's, and we've talked about this before. There's just, there's so much capital in the market that is, that is going to be chasing these real estate deals that, uh, you know, ultimately uh, I, I think it's, it's has a nominal effect, but. All right, Phil. Well, you know, Look, when I have a client that tells me they're doing a 1031 exchange, uh, I, I first need to make sure that they understand what they're getting themselves into. Uh, it's not simple to do. Uh, so really two points on that. I've generally seen when people do a 1031 exchange, especially in the triple net space, they tend to overpay. Uh, and the brokers in that space know that when there's a 1031 buyer, uh, they're going to get a better price typically because these people in their mind, quote, have to place the money. Uh, even though they would have to pay taxes, that would be the worst case scenario. Uh, last I checked, if you make a lot of money, sometimes people are just happy to pay taxes. Uh, number two, if 1031 went away, um, number one, there are alternatives about book investment smart, smart, smart. We'll come up with other ways to figure out how to mitigate that and help grease the wheels. So short term, it might, it might impact real estate, but in the long run, uh, investors typically find a way uh, to work things out so that maybe they make a lot of money, but only pay $750 a year in taxes. Got it. Thank you, Phil. Um, so anyway, uh, we've, uh, we've run up against our, our timeout. So first of all, I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, my panelist uh, colleagues here for attending and providing uh, a lot of insight and information. I really appreciate you devoting the time to, uh, to putting on this uh, webinar. Uh, and to everyone who attended and everyone who's going to get the download, um, uh, I really appreciate you spending the time with us to, uh, to hear about some of the things that are going on. And we look forward to uh, another webinar in the near future to discuss another segment and how COVID is gonna affect it. So with that, I, uh, I conclude. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Um, thanks, everybody.